Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor. And today we're going to be discussing the recent film, Cabrini, and sort of how it was, how it, um, how we reacted to it, and whether or not we enjoyed the film, what we enjoyed about it, maybe our critiques of the film. And with me, I have Angela Erickson of Integrated with Angela Erickson. Welcome to the show, Angela. Welcome back, Thank I guess. I say. Yeah, it's been a while. Thanks for having me back on. Um, so I saw this last, or sorry, I saw this on Sunday. When did you see it? I saw it late Saturday night. So at about okay. the same time, yeah, it's about as fresh in my memory as it is in yours. Yeah. I... I was apprehensive about seeing this movie more so than I was about like the sound of freedom. What about you? Yeah, I had the same experience. I mean, I, I was reading both sides of the debate and wondering like, is it really this feminist trope that I have seen it portrayed as, or is it what some other people are saying? Like, it's not that at all. I was like, there's just so much conflicting information out there uh, that I, I had to go see it. I actually, I probably watched, I don't know, four or five movies every year in total. Um, I, it's like years that I, between going to the actual movie theater, I don't watch movies that much, but I, this was one of those things where I'm like, okay, it's, it's just, it's showing a Catholic nun, which is awesome. So I want to support that. Um, and in a positive light, I would say overall like that, the goal at least of the movie was in a positive light. Um, so I want to support that. Uh, but also I want to know for myself, like, what is, what is my view? What would my view be if I saw this? Do it, do it, would I think it's some feminist thing or not? So is that kind of where you were at as well? Were you sort of like, oh, what is going on here? Well, so my whole thing was I didn't, uh, on the surface of it, I was sort of excited that there was going to be a movie about a saint, but it wasn't the kind of movie at least that I expected to enjoy from a story standpoint. I, you know, I, I mean, I think they were right to try and market specifically more towards women, though I don't know if the marketing was done in a way that, uh, I, that women were actually driven to the theaters because I don't think the movie is doing too well at the box office right now. Yeah. Uh, which I think is a shame, but I think it's actually a problem of the marketing. The Sound of Freedom was... So this is Angel Studios, for anybody who doesn't know. This is the same people who made uh, The Sound of Freedom. So it, it theoretically should have the same sort of bent of The Sound of Freedom. I thought that it didn't feel exactly like that. I felt that yeah. it was, it, it felt a lot different. And I wonder if that was because of Jim Caviezel's uh, attachment to the sound of freedom and maybe the fact that they were working with um, who, the, who's the actual person in sound, the guy in sound of freedom, the real guy, uh, Tim Ballard. Um, yeah. Tim Ballard. Yes. So working with Tim Ballard, I kind of think that they had a, maybe a more um a, basically a viewpoint going in or a story to tell that would reach more people and the way they approached cabrini at least with the trailers seemed like it was trying to overdo a feminist sort of uh, uh concept especially with their uh the release on international women's day which is basically a communist uh holiday yeah that is is created i mean it's it seems so weird that they would pick that as their marketing and it also like this movie isn't a romantic movie or anything like that like i think most women go to movies for you know lo like love stories or um I, I mean you could uh what other types of movies do you think women go mostly to see like, um, yeah, I mean, like you, you, I think the typical thing for a lot of women is like the rom-com type of yeah. thing. Um, and, and I will say too, I think sound of freedom is just a, it's a totally different genre of movie. I mean, these are current events happening. True. The historical context is a lot more recent and it's so sensational, right? Um, the Cabrini story is not mother Cabrini. That's not going to be quite as sensational. We're a little bit more removed historically from, 
uh, what was happening when Italian immigrants were and Irish immigrants were coming to the United States and, and uh, camping out in New York. Um, so I do think that the whole framing of the movie was just going to be different anyway, because it is, it's, it's more of like a, I don't know, like a embellished historical documentary type of thing. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not going to be like this super fast paced action movie. You're not dealing with the cartels in the same way. I mean, yes, you still got the mob, but I mean, that's, that's a backstory that's like barely touched on uh in in a direct way whereas here you have children that you are saving in that moment from very horrific um sexual violence so that's just going the nature of it is going to be different even though there is there are some similar themes they're just not as prevalent or as top of um they're not going to be right at the top of, of what's being covered in a movie about a saint you know well interesting enough children is the uh the sort of factor that uh, connects yeah. both movies, you know, really, which I kind of think they should have leaned into that in the marketing. Like, absolutely. They, they like children at risk. Like it, it focused too much on the international women's day thing. Like sort of the, the Shania Twain thing. Like that was super disjointed. I mean, it was, which part was that? That one of the, one of the trailers that they put out, I think it was on international women's day had this Shania Twain, like, man, I feel like a woman. Bam, bam, da, da, da. Yeah. That whole like overlaid over mother Cabrini. <laughs> it's just like, this is, it was like, um, it would be like going to an extraordinary form mass and then singing on Eagle's wings. Like everyone is talking about, on each <laughs> but, it, but you know, it's that, it's that feeling of like, this doesn't integrate properly. It feels disjointed and not cohesive. And when I saw that trailer, I was like, this is really weird. This just doesn't, this doesn't look right. It would, it would be more appropriate for a rom-com, which this is not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it, it seems like the marketing was just, not as good like the sound of freedom had much better marketing campaign going for it and it made like uh, the first trailer i i did a trailer review of it and it just didn't it didn't interest me as much as i was hoping that it would but the really the best parts of this movie is where at the heart they deal with children and they deal with her sort of uh, raising people out of um, not just poverty, but also um, uh, decadence. Well, yeah, I mean, and there are just so many. Um, I, I think the historical for me, uh, a historical movie is, is way more appealing to me than a rom com. I don't know. I'm like not a normal woman or something. I I don't get it. But this I felt like I, I don't know about you, but I felt like the movie in general actually it was a longer movie. I mean, it's almost two and a half hours, but it didn't feel like two and a half hours. And like the cinematography was really beautiful. And, um, just the overall framing, I thought they did a wonderful job and how they actually shot the movie. Uh, what were your thoughts about it, about the movie artistically, uh, trailers aside and, and sort of how we almost feel that it was kind of misrepresented. It didn't quite represent what the movie was really about in my opinion. Yeah, I think it was really well shot. Like, it was extremely beautiful. Like, all the technical things were extremely well done. The only thing that I think I saw that uh, wasn't very well done were there times when it was dark. Like, it was almost pitch black. And you really couldn't see anything. I think this is most exhibited when the nuns are, you know, hiding in this room, you know, just their first night in um new york uh, yeah in new york under the threat of a pimp basically uh and uh they the lighting is just bad like it um i this is kind of akin to there was um for anybody who's a fantasy person you know interested in fantasy shows and stuff like that there was a whole complaint around like one whole battle and um game of thrones which is very different from this, of course, but uh, where it was basically you couldn't see anything what was going on. And that was kind of it. I I thought it could have been lit where it obviously was obvious that it could have been obvious that it was dark, but mm -hmm. the way you light in darkness is, you know, I mean, there's ways to do that. I'm not an expert on that. I just know that there is a way to light things 
where it you know it's dark, but obviously you can see what's going on. And I didn't. Uh, and that was a there's a very minor complaint because it was only like a brief part of the movie. Well, I think there were a few scenes kind of like that. And I don't know if it was uh, it was like almost like a filter kind of it felt like on certain scenes in the movie that sort of gave it this dirty feeling. And I kind of wonder if that's what they were going for, because um, so much of, of the environment was dirty, you know, so much dust and dirt and like vermin, things like that. I don't know if if maybe that's kind of what they the feel that they're trying to convey is sort of that dirtiness of five points um, in New York City at that time, because then the rest of the city, when you actually got into the city away from five points, uh, was very beautiful. Right. And, and the imagery was quite clear. Um, and then and then you sort of get more of that dirtiness again or that dustiness when you would be, for example, when they were walking into some of these buildings that needed to be renovated, you know, it, it mm -hmm. sort of like came back and forth between that. So I wonder if that's maybe perhaps what they were going for um, when you were there like a few moments see now i'm interviewing you i'm sorry i can't stop <laughs> that's fine no no <laughs> go ahead i, uh, I'm, but I i'm enjoying this but I, i'm curious for you like what was it like for you to hear um i felt like there were a few lines in there where i was like yeah i could see that uh this could be considered feminist you know or like a, a feminist proclamation of of sorts uh but what were your uh thoughts or like were there are specific moments where you were like, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah. So there were moments when I thought she, like, I don't think mother Cabrini, I, I could be wrong about this. I don't really know too much about her personality or whatever, but it just seemed off that she wouldn't uh, focus so much on the gospel and more about the fact that, she's a woman like that just seems a little off-putting but what i thought was great was that in no part of the movie does she ever basically disobey her uh, her her um her uh, superiors yeah and all of these superiors are men and she fights for what she believes is right to do but what she does is she is um, basically if the Pope had said no, she wasn't going to uh, disobey him. That was pretty clear. Um, she just wanted to get at his heart and mm -hmm. bring him around to her way of thinking. And I do think the whole I don't know how much that the, the woman aspect really had to do with the sort of relationship between the Pope, who I think think would be Pius the 10th was it Pius the 10th at that time I mean, I Pius yeah Pius. let's see um I'm trying to think it was the 1890s I think it was Pius the 10th yeah so it's really interesting because yeah this is back in the late 1800s that this is going on and and to me that just is like it's hard to even think about that um it feels like forever ago. And of course it wasn't considering that America historically speaking is, is a very young country. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of who Pope Pius the 11th is the one who beatified her. And then yeah, she's canonized by Pope Pius the 12th. So mm -hmm. maybe it is the 10th. That would kind of make sense. Um, uh, <clears throat> somebody in the comments, you should let us know if you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but what one speaking of the Pope though, because one of the things I loved about Cabrini was the way that the Pope was portrayed. Even though she was often butting heads with her male superiors, the Pope was a loving father and he was portrayed as such. Um, even when they had oh, disagreements, Leo he was, the 13th. Oh, it was Leo the 13th. Um Yes, the Pope did yeah. say no. She wanted to go to China, and Leo the Thirteenth told her to. Um, he had to go to the New World instead, which is true. And then she did, and he said, "If if you have a, an idea of like having a world mission, then why does it matter where you begin?" Um, and so I and I loved that. I loved the way that the Pope is portrayed because it it demonstrated that not every man was um, out to get her in that sense, and the Holy Father was truly a father to her. He was very. Um, 
it, like he looked at her with a lot of endearment. I thought that the actor did such a wonderful job. But I will say too, I mean, the historical context is really important. Women just didn't have rights. And so maybe she did. I mean, who knows? It would be hard to know for, for sure. But, um, you know, maybe she was questioning if a lot of this was because she was a woman. Um, I, I don't know. It's hard to know what exactly uh, her character was. It is certain that she was extremely persistent. <laughs> she almost never took no for an answer. And if she did get no, then she found a really brilliant workaround uh, for that no. And so, uh, I mean, it does, I think people have to keep in mind, we live in a very egalitarian society now. Um, it was not that way. In, <laughs> it wasn't that way uh, in the early 1900s, right? I mean, women didn't have rights. They weren't entrusted with money. They didn't own property, um, things like that. There well, were some did, some did, not some all. did, some did. It, it, it was unusual. It well, because it it was un, it was unusual because it wasn't necessary. If right. it was necessary, it would have been the case that more women would. But it wasn't necessary. But also, women like I mean, she's a nun. She find she finds her rights within the church. Yes, she doesn't mm -hmm. need like any special rights. Like she doesn't need feminism to no. uh, to provide for her the you know things the necessity like. Like feminism was more uh, popular amongst sort of um, arist uh, um, aristocrats, wealthy, yeah. wealthy women, not not just aristocrats, mainly just wealthy women yeah. who um, already had actually a lot of more um, power in society um, at the time. But of course, this is before suffrage. Anyways, this was before um, yeah. the suffragette movement. Um which I think the suffrage, I think the suffragette movie is actually best summed up in Mary Poppins. Uh, oh, it's been a long time since I've I've uh, seen Mary Poppins. You know the mo the mother is the worst character in that movie. She she's like the big bad, I think, in my opinion. Oh, she interesting. Completely has abandoned her children mm, and to yeah. the nanny, and n she doesn't ever seem to care. And oddly enough, the only one who actually cares about how the kids are raised is the father. Well, now, so I, I can I put a, a, a finer point on that? I, it was really interesting. I was listening to a great interview. This is a little bit of a side tangent, but um, I was listening. Side tangent. That's OK. We uh, I was listening to this interview last night um, on Girl Boss Interrupted by Helen Roy, which is a great podcast. And she was interviewing Nancy Piercy uh, about her book about toxic masculinity. And, um, or not, not toxic, I think restoring masculinity, but it involves toxic in the title. Anyway, um, she talks about how prior to the industrial revolution, men often usually worked at home with their families. And so even most child rearing books were written for the, the fathers. They actually weren't written for the mothers uh, because dads were home with their kids and their wives. Uh, it's just really interesting. Um, so yeah. Anyway, hon, I hear Veronica. I'm gonna have to let her in my in my studio. Just a minute. Okay. But uh, Darren's uh, commentary on this is uh, regarding. Uh, I believe this is regarding Mary Poppins. That uh, the mother is completely absent and focused on her own political aspirations, which is so true. That it sort of sums up where feminism comes from. And of course, it doesn't really come from the the poor so veronica welcome to there the we show go. give everybody her their their uh veronica fix she's huge now by the way <laughs> uh, but adorable. yeah so i think the whole thing with cabrini is like i don't know i mean how much is the the sort of like sex disparity you could say um embellished is it embellished i'm not totally sure i'm sure that that played a role the same way that um, immigrants were discriminated against because they were Italian or, or Irish, well, which, um, I, think I thought it's was more really because important. they're, for, I believe, I think it's more because they're foreign, not like we're stuck on this idea that, oh, it's because they were Irish or because they were Italian. It's more because they were foreign and yes um, but they were treated way worse th in particular. They were considered dirty f for different oh, reasons. Yeah. You know, um, maybe more so than like English would have been. 
I, oh, I yeah, mean, if you had an English, English aren't foreign. Hmm? The, the well, English exactly. Aren't the British, to yeah. Americans, mm -hmm. the British aren't foreign to Americans because I mean, the culture. Basically, if you were of the like Anglo, either Anglo-Saxon or Celtic, you were you were already sort of within the family of um, the Anglosphere. So if you came to America, you wouldn't be foreign. So, I mean, this is a general commonality is everywhere in the world. People are, uh, people are always, let's just say, un, uh, unwelcoming to foreign things. Like they, they right. don't, I mean, we kind of live in an opposite for, world yeah. in the United States <laughs> yeah. where basically yeah. we worship almost all foreign Diversity things. is our strength. Well, it's not, yeah, well, diversity is not even just foreign. It's like, I mean, there's a part of that. But anyway, so I think there, it's important to understand the context that it's not just, oh, we hate Italians or, it's, oh, if the, it, we hate, um, we hate the Irish or whatever. If the, um, if the French came over, they wouldn't be happy if the French were there. If the Spanish came over, the Spanish wouldn't be very welcome. The Germans were equally uh, dis disliked as well, which actually the fact that this is an Irish bishop actually is very important for the story because not because I mean, he have a, has a personal story of the fact that his father was an immigrant, but also because the Irish were notorious for wanting to fit into society. Mm -hmm. And at and they law and their Catholic faith was given up as a way in a very uh, not in practice not in the sense that they stopped practicing their faith, but they stopped putting their faith at the forefront of their lives because they wanted to be accepted. And this happened with a lot of Irish bishops, the mm -hmm. German bishops. This is this is a time in America where Americanism was a big mm -hmm. battle in the United States, the idea that in America things, the church should look different than it does in other places than in the old world. And that battle was really uh, fought between the German bishops and the Irish bishops. And they were, they were quite fierce about it. And the Pope came down upon the, the side of the German bishops, but the Irish bishops basically still won because the Irish bishops just kind of ignored the Pope. And that's kind of, that's kind of where our like high, if, if we want to see where, where the American hierarchy has become weak and wh why is that? Why is the American hierarchy so weak and willing to bend the knee to like the city or the government or, you know, we have this, um, what's it? The Al Smith dinner for the pre for the elections for president. It's basically a, a way for the archbishop of, of New York to basically party or engage with and be chummy with the presidential candidates. It, this is how it started. It started with the archbishops or the bishops, the Irish bishops trying to get into, um, you know, into good standing with the people. Uh, Supage is Croatian actually. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Mac. Anyways, so so did you see that in it? I mean, with that context, does that change anything of your view of the of no. the Archbishop there? I mean, I, I I think he was in a rock and hard place, right? I mean, and that's portrayed. I mean, yeah, there's when you get into the higher echelons of the church, which I I witnessed firsthand when I worked for LifeSite. My job was to raise money for LifeSite as a major gift officer. I I went to these big Legatus meetings. I met high higher players that financially in Baltimore. I actually went to like this um, Legatus meeting with the Archbishop there and um, and several major donors in the Baltimore um, diocese, archdiocese. And uh, yeah, politics is always going to be there. Um, there's always that element uh, when you're when you're talking about any sort of institution right and they're going to be playing politics within the institution itself and from without to gain more influence and power i'm not saying that that's always inherently a good thing but it's just reality um and so i think that is definitely portrayed this position that he's in i mean even when he's speaking with the mayor 
um, you can tell he's disgusted by what the the mayor is saying, right? And he mm. he's he's not saying anything. He he drinks his drink is it, it, almost like a handshake, right? Um, it's almost like I I accept that I'm just going to take this verbal beating from you and your racism, and uh, I'm just going to move along because I don't want you to pull all this funding away from my church. And that's the thing is that Cabrini, the, this were the, the feminism or not the feminism thing, but the fact that she's a woman, I think is a real, at that time would have been a real uh, barrier for her because she was unable to get funding from the city. Um, it wasn't just that she was working underneath the church, but she was trying to work within city limits as well. And that was a huge inhibitor for her. Um, and I think that can't be overlooked either. Well, I don't I don't think it was necessarily a feminine problem. I think it was a Catholic versus Protestant problem. No, I totally disagree. I think it was a, right. a woman and Italian problem. I think it was that she was both a female and Italian. Men, I mean, you men would not have uh, given huge loans to women at that time. If even if she had been an American woman, they would not have likely done that. Well, I, I don't I don't I just don't see that that necessarily the case being the fact that St. Elizabeth Ann Seton had basically uh, done something uh, not exactly similar, but she had run uh, schools and she had run orphanages as well. Uh, and I can't imagine she didn't get her funding um, in, you know, I imagine she didn't get her, she was penny, she didn't have money, I don't think. So she had to get her money somewhere. Yes, let's see. When it was, but she was... Okay, she was, so she was, she was born, older. She was older than her. She, yeah, she I guess that's before. a good question. I I, I don't know. That's I hard think, to. I think the big difference. I mean, you're right about the Italian part in this case, uh, because um, the d big difference between Mother, uh, or sorry, Saint Elizabeth Ann Seton was that she was an American born versus Cabrini, yeah. who was an immigrant. So there was that Italian part, but their difference is one of the differences is that. Um, in, in um, a industrialization, it's not just like men versus women. It's actually the structure of society is breaking down in this in these cities because it's not important to them as much um, that people are, you know, that people's lives are made better, but it's more important the money that everybody's making. That, yeah. That's at the heart. While St. Elizabeth Ann Seton was almost in a more or less almost pre-industrialization uh, or early industrialization time yeah. period. So I don't think it's so much the womanhood. I mean, there might be a difference of I, I just don't think the like the treating of women had changed that much between um, uh what was it between the between like the 1820s and the 1890s? I just can't see that being the case. I think it has a lot to do with you're right that the the Italian part, but again, that's just mm -hmm. foreigner thing. You know, we don't yeah. like foreigners, and um, also it really is an American thing where if people come here on their own, it's not they're not our responsibility, which I think makes a better argument for why we should have a stronger control over our immigration system, even back then. Cause if you have a society where, you know, of course also like there was no welfare state at this time, but right. But also you have to understand that cities can only handle taking care of so many impoverished people at a time. And that's not just uh, in the sense of government. That's also in the private sense, like private citizens can only handle Taking care, nuns can only handle uh, taking care of this amount of people. So we don't need more impoverished people than we can handle. And another big problem with this is the reason Italians came over in droves during the late 1800s was because of Italian unification. Their worlds had been destroyed it, through, uh, through liberalism and nationalism. Wasn't that just celebrated yesterday? What was it? I think it was uh, the unification of Italy, like day, like the <laughs> well, anniversary of it. That's super funny. Well, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if also if the, another aspect of that is 
if the unification hadn't happened, Mother Cabrini would have gone to the Pope and the Pope would have had uh, money. He would have had money to give to her and he could have provided uh, her with the means to do what she wanted to do instead of having to rely on the goodwill of everybody else because the because Rome was a state, was a country uh, mm. before Italian unification. That's a really good point. So yeah. the, the destruction of cultures is the, and uh, the destruction of societies is the reason so many people ended up in these places. This is a perfect message for let's not go let's not go to war destroying people's lands in order for them to have to come here. And let's get a handle of our own immigration. I think that's like I don't think that's the th message that this most is the people this is get. the movie that Connor wishes they had made. <laughs> well, no, no, I no, I no, I think <laughs> I'm it getting, is. I'm I think it is the movie they made. It's just that nobody understand. Not many, not no one. Many people don't understand the context of history in order to understand right. the situation. And I, I'll give them that they did not do they did not do a good job of setting up the um, the context of the world that that Mother Cabrini was living in. They gave they gave very um, personal uh, anecdotes. You know they 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 um, they showed the kid who had been abandoned and the mother who had died. That was very important for the story. And that's very important for the heart of the story. Yeah, be, and that's what Alejandro Monteverde, I think, does the best. Does that make sense? All right, my camera is like acting up for some reason. I don't that's know. That's all right. Why. You don't have to be visible. I know. I've always, I, you know, my grandpa always told me I had the perfect face for radio. And, uh, you know, Please this is stop. just maybe God. I'm not kidding. Maybe this is God's way of. <laughs> I miss him. He is Irish, actually. Oh, okay. Very, very, very Irish. Um, also, I don't, when I, uh, you know, I've been very critical of the Irish. I'm also very Irish. Uh, that's, well, yeah, your last name is McHugh, so I would assume. Yes. So I have, I, uh, I have a strong um, interest in my Irish uh, history, but I think it's important that you can be able to um, basically call out the failings in the his in your history in your uh, people's history in order to recognize that we weren't perfect obviously that's one oh. of the problems with like uh, nationalism i'm, just, I'm just, I might have to jump off for a second and yeah. come back on because um all right yep, my connection's not great i'll be right back okay okay let, let me Uh, Darren saying that, um, <laughs> that Mother Cabrini was born in Austria, meaning Lombardy in, uh, what became Northern Italy. Okay. That's, that's kind of funny. Um, which is also very, you know, Mac wanted to know where, what soupage, uh, his nationality was and the Croatian, you know, uh, Lombardian is not that far off from Croatian in, in, um, in distance anyways uh welcome welcome back you're muted see now and now the computer doesn't even want me to use my voice on here is pick, oh, pick one pick one or the other <laughs> uh well anyways so i can't remember what was the question you asked me what was it was like it? Like what moments in the movie did you go okay that that sounded not my favorite that sounded very feminist Okay. Um, that was the original question. I think, I mean, I had a couple of parts where I was like, you know, I wish that would have, I wish the script would have been a little different here. Yeah. Wait, can you give me yours? I'd, I'd like to hear yours first. So the first one was, uh, when they first are sent by the Pope to America and she's talking to her sisters about what they're going to do. And she says something we, can, we only need to trust in ourselves, I think is what she says. Uh. And that was one where I was like, no, you trust in God. <laughs> you trust that God is going to provide for your needs. This isn't about yeah. trusting in yourself. That's That was some of the language that I was like, I don't feel like a saint or even a sister who isn't a saint. I don't think a sister would generally speak that way. Or anybody religious in any capacity. 
no, I mean, it was just, so that to me, I was like, okay, the script is not the best there. Um, would have loved to see that. And I do think that there were some missed opportunities. I'm not saying that they should have had like every five minutes, uh, mother Cabrini in an adoration chapel or at mass or something, but I would, I would have loved to see more of the sacramentality of Catholicism, which is people naturally are drawn to that because Catholicism is naturally so beautiful. That's why often I think in movies and things like that, that's what you see there in Catholic churches. Um, the crucifix is a very powerful symbol. I actually was wondering too, if um, the crosses that they wore with their habits, if that was actually what it looked like, because it wasn't a crucifix, it was like a silver cross. And I kind of wondered if that was historically accurate as well. Um, th there were just some details there that I was like, I don't know, like I can understand some of the criticism that people had in that regard. And then the last line of the movie um, was an interesting one because I could see that uh, people would hear and get, a, in, uh, get up in arms about it because because when the mayor says to her, which was in the trailer, you know, Cabrini, you would have made a fine man. And she says, no, I wouldn't have. Because man, men can't do what we do. And I could have seen a lot of people get upset about that. And th But I sat there and I thought, sure, to maybe somebody who's like looking for a feminist bent, that then that's what they would see. Yeah. But it's objectively true that men can't yeah. do what women do and women can't do what men do. Like what she said there is objectively true. So it was kind of an instance where you have the the producer, whoever wrote the script doing that, I think, intentionally, because you're going to hear what you want to hear, basically. Well, but I think there needed to be a, more, a longer response to that question or that to that point. Like, well, it, you it, don't it's the last line of the movie. You're not going to draw it out with a bunch of nuance. You know what I mean? Well, I'll maybe phrase <laughs> a little differently. Like it, it just it could have been clearer. I, sure. I agree that people are going to uh, take from that what they want to. And I thought the same way. I was like, it's objectively true. But people are going to take that in the completely wrong way. Sure. But I mean, and another thing, too, is I think Catholics have to understand that this movie wasn't made for Catholics. Like it was made for a much larger audience. I mean, they put wasn't it like a 50 million dollar budget? Yeah, but um, it's not getting that. That's the problem. But that's I know. I know. And I do agree with you. I think that's some of the marketing and all of that. But the, I think the idea behind it was to attract more than just Catholics. Um, oh, and sometimes I think definitely. Catholics, we want because we're looking and thirsting for like beautiful music and beautiful movies and beautiful artwork. And this looked like a great opportunity for that. There certainly was the investment made. Um, but it's, it's not ever going to be perfect because that's not just for Catholics. But this is the problem. This is the difference between like the, the passion movie. Like it's a bunch of people. I think even Glenn Beck, uh, which is, he's a Mormon, so he's not even Christian anyways, but uh he 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 said that it was the best christian movie since the passion and i saw this a lot this is just completely untrue by i, I don't well i don't know what the i would say sound of freedom was a much more interesting christian movie than, oh you think so i mean yeah, yeah. i guess that, that maybe that would be a, a matter of taste i i thought this was more and and, and maybe it was too some of it my perception is colored a little bit because there's been some pretty unflattering news that has come out about Tim Ballard since that was uh, produced. And so I don't know, it sort of just soured the taste that I have for all of that. Well, I try to, I'm trying to keep my, uh, keep, keep, re keep the focus on the fiction, you know, like yeah. what the fiction, the movie itself, we, I, I want to look at that purely sure. and, I think that was a better movie um, uh, regarding entertainment value and um, and messaging as well. I, I mean, it had more God in it, I think, you could argue. Yeah, uh, potentially. I mean, I do think there were quite a few uh, references to scripture, not as many as I would have liked, of course. But, um, I mean, she does quote scripture a few times throughout the movie. It's just not as blatant and in your face as I think a lot of people, a lot of us would have liked. But it's just like, what's her motivation in this movie versus what Tim Ballard's motivations, you know, is in Sound of Freedom. Like, I actually, it seems to me that Tim Ballard's, uh, Tim Ballard in the movie, Jim Caviezel's Tim Ballard, is actually more dedicated to 
faith. Of course, I know it's the Mormon thing, but like they didn't touch on anything related to Mormonism at all. No, I mean, and I don't know that I totally agree with that. I mean, often Mother Cabrini is talking about the need to take care of the poor. In fact, when she goes before um, the Roman Senate, I believe, is, um, is I don't know if that's Italian. the correct name for the body or whatever, but Italian's I mean, she kind of. she does make a very strong case for taking care of the poor and the impoverished, so like the corporal works of mercy. And she's, and she's very emphatic and passionate about this. I mean, she gets up there, they tell her to get out and she says, no, <laughs> she's well, like, yeah, gonna, but that, you know, but the re that wasn't related to religion specifically. The per somebody else could have done the same speech and had no faith theoretically. Like, no, I mean, uh, she's quoting the, she's quoting from scripture loosely in that scene. Okay. Well, the way it comes across, at least, it, uh, I don't remember what she was quoting or it, cause it didn't seem like she was quoting anything. No, she, when I, she when was I loosely it. quoting, I think in okay. Matthew, um, yeah, you know, whoever takes care of the poor and the, the hungry, I mean, she goes through, yes, all of that. And then says, you know, wh of, why aren't we helping fund this? These are our people, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, great messaging. I'm just saying that it, it to me, it scream. It oddly enough seems more religious in Sound of Freedom to me. That's that's all that I, I yeah uh, I understand. Um, I understand that there is you know in the background to me there's more religion in Cabrini, but there's almost more of a Christian marketing at not marketing but like message on the mm. on the front, like head on in sound of freedom i guess that's the difference there's it's more it's way more subtle i guess you could say which i think it in 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 a weird way it should be the opposite like sound of freedom could have been a lot less like the uh, could have been a lot less straightforward and it still would have been fine but cabrini i thought didn't do as well because it wasn't as straightforward it was it made it a, a lot more of the background and also it proved the the fact that people aren't going to see this movie as much proves that their strategy was flawed. Yeah, I think again that really comes down to the marketing. I so here's a criticism on the flip side that I have of a lot of those like God is not dead type movies, and I'm not saying that Sound oh. of Freedom falls into that category specifically, but the more religious yeah. movies those that have the very overt. Um, evangelical bent to them is that they're really preachy and people don't like them because they aren't, it's not well done enough. It doesn't feel realistic. And I think, Definitely. I think that maybe um, the director wanted to avoid that sense of like, Oh, we're just preaching at you. I mean, that that's a yeah. consideration. I'm not. And again, like this is where I'm saying, I'm trying to understand it. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. But I could see that being something taken into consideration because that's a criticism that I have of things like God, God is not dead and God is not dead, too. Oh, all yeah. These no, I mean, movies. those those evangelical movies are quite terrible. What I just mean is that I don't think that Mel Gibson's Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ holds anything back regarding the faith. No, because and, it is the faith. I mean, that's exactly. the difference, too. But that's you're talking about portraying the crucifixion of the Messiah and his pit. Sure. Like that's literally, you're actually taking the Bible. You can't separate those two or like lack, you can't make it nuanced. You can't like make it subtle. That's just what it is. You know, but how is, a, that was how, how is a nun's life and nun's mission, not, you know, inherently Catholic. And, and how can you, how can you make that, uh, how can you lessen that? I think lessening it actually was a um, a a poor choice because it didn't give. I don't know. It, it the heart was there with the children, but her story wasn't as interesting. I don't think as the what she was doing for the children. I know that's part of her story, but like the um the rest of her story wasn't as interesting because it didn't seem to have as much to do with her faith and more very, and instead more sort of what appears to be much more secular. Um, uh, so, so I, I guess I just don't I like, yeah. I, yes, I can understand that, but I think 
it is obvious to me that the gospel, she was living it out in a non-preachy way. I mean, her whole mission is to serve the poor. If that's not the, if that's not part of the gospel, like I don't really know what is. I don't think she's doing it for, for pure ambition. She's not looking to elevate herself. She's just really looking at the interests of how do we serve the needs of the poor, people who are sick. How do we build a, a good Catholic hospital? Um, it's just stuff like that. Like I don't think you have to make it explicit when the mission it's implicit. Yeah, no, well, I, I'm not saying I disagree with that. I'm just saying that, and I don't think it comes across as that she was doing it for ambition. I'm saying a lot of her values are, a lot of the values that she is straightforward about, so many of them are secular values, but who could, e who could, which could have easily been given um, a more Catholic reasoning behind them in her story. And I just felt that that was a little lacking. I'm not talking. I don't want a preachy movie. This this isn't a criticism saying it should have been preachy. I'm not saying it should have been. I'm saying it didn't. I didn't think it integrated the faith as well as it could have. I just think there's missed opportunities. I I totally agree movie. with you on that. Yes. And like, so it's not really a criticism. Like, I I enjoyed the movie. That's the thing. Is I'm just only talking about how could it have been made better. How, yeah. what, what could have been made better. It, it It's actually, I mean, in some sense, it's just a good building block. I just thought that Sound of Freedom, I w thought, okay, this is this is a really big way to start, sort of. Angel Studios is like more religious, sort of, um, but story-driven, like people-driven stories that aren't preachy, that aren't... Um, that aren't, you know, God's not dead. You know, the, the point of these movies is to actually make art, not to make yeah. um, preaching. It's not It's not supposed to be preaching. So the point I'm trying to hammer home is that it has, it's, it's star, it started really well with Sound of Freedom. I think this one was close, but not as good. And I think that it shows in the, in the, well, part of it's because of the marketing. But also, it shows in the um, the box office, which they put way too much money into this movie. I think that, which I mean, I appreciate that they did put money into it, but I think it was a bit of a, um, I I think it was a bit of a gamble on their part, especially mm -hmm. like I don't know. Did what? How do you think they could have gotten the the feminine? Um, um audience much more cuz i think that's the key, that was the key to this movie can they get could they get women to come see this movie and i think it failed yeah i mean it's it's uh it's hard because like the way that she's portrayed is she is um like i said she doesn't take no for an answer really she's very persistent determined these are good qualities um but I don't think they're generally associated with femininity, um, they, which is what you see in The Sound of Freedom. Let's just continue on that example. I mean, you see Tim Ballard being persistent, determined, not really taking no for an answer, taking things into his own hands. You see very similar qualities, but I think that's generally attributed more as a ma as masculine traits. Um, and I'm people may not know this about me, but I'm pretty uh, I would consider myself like a pretty strong um, person that. I, I generally say what I, I really think I am not, I, I mean, yeah, sometimes I'll walk away from a fight if I just don't think that it's worth it. But generally speaking, if it's something I'm really passionate about, um, I've actually been told many times I'm too direct, um, with people and, uh, which is not a trait that you want to have as a Minnesotan. If you're a Minnesotan and you're too <laughs> direct, it's a problem. People don't like that. Um, and so, I actually saw a lot of myself in how Mother Cabrini was portrayed. And I think for people that can be off-putting, um, I think that's why she actually runs with the men pretty well and is able to hold her ground very well. I found that in my own life. Um, I generally relate better to men. Um, so for me, that was appealing. <laughs> now I realize I'm not all of, all of women. We're all different. Um, I don't know. 
I actually thought that they did a pretty good job balancing it, though, because she's extremely nurturing. You see her with those kids, the way she weeps over the children who are dying, the way she she nourishes them, the way she uh, even disciplines them is very um, it is very motherly. She describes the children that she's taking care of as her children. Um, and and that really speaks to that spiritual motherhood that our sisters are supposed to have. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's mostly a marketing problem. Like I, at the very end of the day, I think the way that they marketed this movie was not, it didn't play the way that they thought it would. I think a lot of the women who are inclined to go see a movie about a nun, they're not feminists. They're not, they're not feminists. Um, and I think, I actually really think culturally right now, we're seeing a shift. We're seeing like there's a lot of polarization in general politically, uh, but even amongst women, there is a major rift between the quote unquote trad wives, people who are looking back and trying to reclaim femininity, uh, make make life beautiful again and connect with motherhood uh, versus the girl boss babes, right? And so you're not going to get the girl boss babes to go see a movie about a nun. I mean, not unless they're like, yeah, fight the patriarchy in the church. But most of them are not interested in Catholicism um, or even Christianity in general. So that's where I think they went went wrong. I think if you're going to cater towards women who are going to go see a movie about a Catholic nun, you're going to want to portray her femininity and build that aspect up while also counterbalancing that with the strength that she displays over and over again, her physical strength. I mean, she's sick the whole, she's very, very sick. Um, this whole time, almost dying, she's very weak. And yet she continues to fight on every single level. So those are the things that I think, um, it was more of a marketing issue in my estimation than anything else. I think the movie itself was overall very well done. Uh, but there were definitely some missed opportunities. Yeah, very true. Well put. Um, I don't know if this is Jason or Mark. It's Jason. Oh, it is Jason. I don't yeah. think the values could be completely secular. No way. That's a modern idea based on a Christian foundation. Look at the world pre-Christian. Yes, that's true. I'm not saying when when I was saying that what uh, she appears to have secular values. I I wasn't meaning that in the sense that the origin of her values are secular, but that people will take them as secular values if they if it isn't sort of proposed or made as obvious or as clear and this doesn't have to be like hitting your head over or hitting hitting, hitting it over your head um that it is catholic I uh, I think the way that they could have resolved that was to incorporate more sacramentality I mean, I think that would have resolved a lot of it. Her praying at mass during a difficult moment when she's faced with a wall, right? Where, where there's a wall, she's not, she's being told she can't do something. I would expect that the first place a nun would go would be to mass or to adoration or something to go pray and be present to our Lord um, or, in that or way. Even you, you even could have had, I assume she had a confessor at the time. Like I don't even, know. I mean, you think about it. She just had come for, to America from Italy. I mean, but you had to have a confessor. Yeah. That would be a part of like there would have to be a priest that was somewhat attached to these women in some way. Well, I, think, I think that think, priest was supposed to be, and right, he didn't even okay. come and pick them up when he was supposed to. He ne he neglected yeah. the sisters pretty but significantly. You don't think you don't think they went like they had to have gone to confession somewhere, right? Like, right. I mean, so, it would be nice like, to go see some of those things. Yes, like they had to have. I would have again. Yeah, finding ways to incorporate the sacramentality. And of course, there's a lot of beautiful Catholic imagery that they missed that they could have captured, like the incense, like, you know, all of those things that are like, that is Catholic and it's beautiful. The Gregorian chant, um, I it would have been beautiful to to hear some of that. So and see see those things that really uh, make it very Catholic. Um, but again, the, I don't think it was necessarily catered towards Catholics. So, yeah, this is. And Anne's uh, putting her two cents in it. She hasn't seen it I because the trailers see? turned her off. But okay, and so Anne, this is my question for you. I don't know if you're if you just jumped on the stream or not, but my my She's thought is that the people who are are especially the women that are going to go see it, they're not going to be women who are feminists or have a, have a idealism about feminism. Um, the women who are going to go see a movie about a nun are the, are the women who 
are looking for a feminine role model. Um, I don't know. So I, yeah, again, I just think it's a marketing issue. I think that they were off when they decided to pursue a more feminist Wait, framing. Was, what was your question for her? Sorry. I didn't. I want to know why she out. didn't go see it. Like what about the trailers? Okay. Was it, was it that she was just portrayed kind of as a feminist? Um, even though I, again, I don't think that that's in actuality what the movie overall portrays. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, uh, so uh, it sounds like, um, the, she also didn't go to the PO movie, which also that one was bad, but that was bad was because it? of, oh, that's a that was bad because the director was bad. Like every, pretty much everyone who knew who the director was pretty much saw that it was co that coming down the line, it was going to be a bad movie. Mm because he the guy is just either socialist or communist and you know basically an atheist i think why did um, he make a movie about padre pio then i think he was well it wasn't really about him it was really oh. about the 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 so the um po politics i think of that time period mm -hmm. i haven't seen the movie but that's a lot of what the trailers were like um but obviously the shia La, shia labeouf um conversion is a great um thing to come out of that even though the movie was obviously just a, a mess and made by somebody who hates the faith um now i want to know angela i have a theory and i want to know if you think this theory is correct i see that you, this movie would have been ha um had a more feminine like uh, aspect to it I, like a more clearer feminine aspect a lot of, there were plenty of feminine aspects but a a easier a addition or a quick way to fix the sort of um the feeling that it may not be as feminine is by a, a, like giving mother cabrini some sort of a uh, friend or uh male that whether it be a priest or just a layman that she couldn't be more that she could confide in more because it seems to me that sometimes women, when they have a man that they can trust, come across sometimes to be or are able to be more feminine. I don't know if that is that. Um, am I missing the boat completely there? What do you, you think? know? That's a really interesting thought, honestly. Um, I think we see some of that with the prostitute that sort of comes into the into their fold, right? Um, Vincetta was that her name or something? Uh, Ver wasn't it? Wait, what was it? Uh, it was something with was, a V. I thought it was Veronica. No, no, it wasn't. No, who was it? Um, I would have remembered that. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I would have thought you would. Let me let me just check. I'll check the. I um, but I do think that if she had had because she does sort of become vulnerable at different points, like when they're digging Victoria, for Victoria. Well. Sorry, Victoria. Victoria, but um. Yes. So, I mean, when they're digging for the well, trying to find water, um, she does confide in her that her fear of dying, for example. Um, so you do see more of that vulnerability. Uh, but I agree. I think overall having a confidant throughout the film, that kind of makes sense. I mean, especially... I mean, I would imagine you're a woman, you're traveling with all these sisters um, with like nothing. You have a suitcase. I mean, and you go through all of these really traumatic things, honestly. Um, there had to be a real strong camaraderie there. And she does sort of the way she's portrayed is like she keeps that separate. Like she does not like when when she almost dies, for example, she comes back to the orphanage and she's like, I just need to rest even though the sisters are wanting to take care of her, right? They want to yeah. feed her. They want to make sure she gets enough rest and she won't let anyone take care of her. And I could see that as seeming like a boss babe type of thing. But I also know for myself that when I'm hurting, I tend to isolate. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also a human thing. And so I think, again, like always having this constant framework of like everything is feminism. It just might not be. It just might be a character a part of her character you know sure. um so i don't know i i would have loved to see uh i think that's a really interesting thought i think that would have really um softened her in that regard or added more balance at least you know something that where she could appear where 
because she really put her guard up pretty much the entire almost the entire movie um basically and i even i think maybe even with the doctor they could have um had a little bit of they missed an opportunity maybe again this is not based on my knowledge of mother cabrini's story right if i knew it better maybe i could because i i i um fancy myself a bit of a writer as well so if i if i know the story if i knew the story which i uh wish i kind of did more but um if i knew the story maybe i could find a uh fix to this problem that they that they, that i see that they had at least mm-hmm. um where they where i think i think seeing her vulnerability a little more would have sort of and and even putting that in the advertising a little more might have yeah. needed a more palatable movie um for everyone actually not just women but men also i think i don't think men are interested in going to see the boss babe movie anyways no. so if you if you market it it where which women aren't either so it's just uh, it's, it's yeah, I mean, I do think there some of that was tried, but yeah, there there were some missed opportunities in that regard. Um, you know, when you, I, I'm just thinking of when they're at the hospital um, and and they're in the mine shaft, like that had all exploded, right? Um, and she's trying to tend to the children. It's the, her maternity and her femininity are really drawn out when when she's taking care of the children. Um, yes, and that's the, yeah. yeah, and that's not, but it's just not as much. That's uh, that's not as much of the plot in some sense a lot of the plot is her battles with yes. um the city or with the hierarchy and stuff mm-hmm. like that though again it's i don't believe it's fem the movie's feminist because she doesn't she's not trying to replace uh the cardinals or the archbishop with a woman like it's right. not like she's not saying you know she i mean she's accepted the authority of these men even when they're flawed. And I think it's a good sort of representative for us when we're dealing with a lot of um, weak members of the hierarchy currently. That's a big problem in our church. So Mm -hmm. I understand why that was hit home. But for some people, I do think, even though we all recognize that we have troubles with the hierarchy, I think sometimes for even, even Catholics who or have trouble problems with the hierarchy and want them to change and want to help them move. It's almost still seems insulting, you know, to, uh, you know, the way they sort of advertised it at least. Yep. I agree. I think it, it didn't do justice. And that, and I think too, like that doesn't do justice to mother Cabrini, you know, like just her as an individual to who she was. I can't imagine that she would have loved being portrayed as a feminist in the trailers. Eve, be, even if it was somewhat misrepresentative of the movie as a whole. Uh, and, and that's just my feeling on it. That was another thought that I had too. when the trailers were coming out. I was like, I don't know, like how would mother Cabrini feel about this? You know, would she sort of be like put off by that? The fact that they're portraying her this way. I, I think she probably would have been, even if she loved how the movie portrayed her, you know? Um, yeah. The marketing is a problem. I feel like we need an Italian mother to discuss this with. Yeah, I think, I think an Italian mother needs to do like a to, to be interviewed by somebody to be like, what, like, uh, how much of this is like Italian just, women are strong yeah. women, they, but are. they are, but they're yeah. also extraordinarily yeah. like feminine, like, yes, no, yes. no question so. about that. Yep. And they and they know the difference between and many of them, not all of them probably, but many of them know the difference between feminism and the feminine. So, yeah. it, it um and maybe it's hard. I mean, it's it's also a bunch of men writing this. I think, uh, which I mean, may have been hard to to sort of when when all your experience when so much of your experience, I guess, in movies and, and in writing these days is feminist. I just can't help. And or I can't not believe that that has some influence on the way these writers wrote the character. Well, let's be honest. I mean, despite what people want to tell us today, men can't experience womanhood or femininity, <laughs> you know, so like to try and convey that when you yourself have not experienced it, that can be tough, too. Um, well, yeah. 
So, so I, I do think, think think writers, many of them have done a fine job in the past. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, I mean that that too. I mean, depending on the writer, that could be that could be tough. I mean, some men are definitely more attuned to that than others as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I think overall, I liked it. I thought it was a great movie. I didn't feel like it was a two and a half hour long movie. Um, but Look there at, uh, there were some opportunities. She'd be amazed at the fact that a talkie existed at all. <laughs> yeah, a that talk? a movie existed. A movie. Oh, <laughs> like uh, a non-silent film. I mean, silent films. Oh yeah, that's it. funny. At yeah, that <laughs> Darren, you would. That is what so would funny. what would she think of a movie? Well, it's almost impossible for her to imagine. Yeah, truly. Um, well, um, Angela, anything else? Anything that stood out to you? That you wanna... um, no, I mean, I just thought it was it was captured beautifully. There were some some things that I would have loved to have seen, like I said, the sacramentality and uh, and a little bit more of an emphasis on her feminine nature. But um, overall, I thought it was an excellent movie. And I, I would encourage people to go see it. I didn't feel like it was a feminist trope, but there were moments where I was like, eh, the script could have been a little different. Those are my thoughts overall. Yeah. I understand why people are apprehensive from the, of this movie, and I was apprehensive as well. And it, it's certainly not the best Christian movie since The Passion. I just, I, 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 I think that's can't beat The Passion. It, it, well, well, no, since The Passion, like the best. I don't think it's the best, ca uh, you know, Christian movie since The Passion. I bet there, there has to be better ones than this. But it's a solid. I would say it's a solid B. Mm -hmm. Um maybe B minus there's a lot more to be done. And I just encourage the makers of this film. Well, I, I encourage them in their future endeavors, but I think that they need to be a little more cautious about, well, I guess, well, this is maybe an angel studios problem. Actually angel studios needs to uh, get away from their, uh, like trying to appeal to a, the a public that won't, um, support them and instead just uh, market to the public that will support them. Yep. And Sound of Freedom was marketed towards the people that would support them and Cabrini was not. So I, I they can't they shouldn't be surprised that the people that they wanted to come out and watch didn't do so. And if you find our conversation interesting about this film, I encourage you to do so, but or, or to go see the movie. Um, but I'm not as, I think Angela is more supportive of it than I am, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I also find it a, a good movie, but I'm not like, I'm not going to go see it twice. I won't go to theaters to see it twice, but I'm glad that I went and saw it. Um, I think it's worth seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Angela, tell people about your channel, where they can find you on, on the internet. Well, my channel, I think most of the people in the chat probably know who I am. My channel is called Integrated with Angela Erickson. Um, you can find me on podcasts, on YouTube. Uh, I have Twitter, just be warned. Um, <laughs> Twitter is where you get most of my hot takes. Um, and then I'm on Instagram as well. My handles are like all either at integrated Angela or at integrated Ange. Um, and yeah, you can connect with me over there. I also have a Twitter or not a Twitter. I have a telegram chat as well, which um, you can find usually in the description of my videos. I will be releasing a video in the next day or two uh, of an interview that I had with father Robert Nixon about the devil's bagpipe by um, James Lang, a really interesting historical uh, document detailing the truth about Martin Luther. And it's, I definitely would recommend it because uh, you're just like, your mind's going to be blown. Um, so anyway, please follow me over there, subscribe, like it, all that stuff. And you'll get more of that. Awesome. Well, uh, if you liked this episode of plot lines, please like share, comment, and subscribe and God bless. <laughs>